Sometimes when I interact with friends and family members and loved ones and they mess up and they make mistakes and they upset me or they don't do what they promise to do, I ask myself, is being a good person really that difficult to you? And this is something that I have to actively confront myself with. And I think it's something that we should all confront ourselves with. And that's the question of how difficult is it really to do the good thing? And this kind of brings up a really fascinating aspect of human psychology, something that you need to, need to be really, really aware of. And that is that we carry a collective human guilt, a collective human guilt that has been taught to us since the dawn of Christianity or perhaps even before then. The idea is that humanity, humans, somewhere along the way did something really, really bad, something really, really evil. We messed up, we made a bad decision and that is the reason why we are so unhappy and why we are struggling and suffering so much. We suffer because somewhere along the way our ancestors just really messed up. They did really unspeakable things and now we ask ourselves how can we forgive ourselves for what our ancestors did? How can we forgive ourselves for being human, for coming from, being born from such evil, such failed fragility, such bad behavior? And here, this collective shame, this collective human trauma is something that weighs on us. And there is this image in ancient Greek philosophy of this image of Prometheus. Prometheus, who carried the world on his shoulders, you might say. He carried the guilt of his actions and for what he did. Because he chose to uh, save humanity, because he uh, decided to act in human interests, he was punished by the gods because, of course, humanity was never meant to have the powers that they have today. We're never meant to exist. We're never meant to live the way they do today. And yeah, these are kind of fundamental questions of philosophy. Do humans have a right to live? Have we angered the gods? Have we messed up? Have we done something very, very wrong? And is that why our society is the way it is today? Is that why we're all so unhappy? Is that why we all suffer? Is that why everything is going the wrong direction? So it's important to be aware of the fact that we carry this shame. And it's important to be aware of how this shame impacts our perception of good and evil in our own life in here and now. Essentially, the equation that we're doing is shaped by our guilt. So when we ask ourselves what the right thing to do is, we always put our collective shame on the scale of doing bad. And this collective shame, this makes any good action feel extremely heavy, extremely difficult, and extremely far out of reach. Essentially, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves on the scale of being bad people, of being unhappy people, of being unhealthy people. And we find ourselves looking up at uh, the other side of the scale of being a good person, being a healthy person, being a happy person. And we see that it's so far away. It is so, so far away that it's just out of our grasp. And we do this equation every single time we're confronted with the question of whether we should do a good choice or do a bad choice. And this is often in the most simple situations. As if, for example, when we are confronted with a beggar on the street and we ask ourselves, should I offer to treat this person to lunch? Or in the question of, uh, you know, should I go and help uh, my friends who are moving? Or should I, you know, uh, call my mom who is sick and struggling with something? It's difficult for us to do, make these kind of choices, not because they are difficult. Often they are quite easy. A five minute phone call, uh, coffee <laughs> from our budget, uh, or just a matter of, uh, you know, a few hours in our day. 
But we make these choices out to be so incredibly difficult because we associate them with such dramatic shifts in attitudes, perceptions and behavior and with being such a different person to who we are today. We often tend to, in, in our mind, unconsciously add on to the pile of what is necessary, telling ourselves, well, my mom is sick, so I should uh, quit my job and I should move up to help her uh, through her struggles or, you know, uh, there is poverty in the world and what good would feeding a homeless person do today when there are so many people on the street that need so much help and I just don't have the money or resources or time to help everyone that is suffering. And we tell ourselves, you know, I have so many things happening in a day and I have so many uh, things going on that how could I possibly put aside a few hours for my friends who are moving, right? So. This is how we kind of, uh, this is how this kind of invisible calculation works. And it's all connected to this uh, identification with the good as something great rather than as something simply good. The truth is we don't have to do much to be good people. And this is something I think we should actively remind ourselves. You don't have to do a lot to be a healthy person. All it takes is 10,000 steps a day. All it takes is adding a few extra vegetables on your plate. All it takes is, uh, you know, taking a minute out of your week to call your mom to just check in with her. Uh, it's not really difficult to do small acts of kindness and it's the small acts of kindness that are the greatest. We often consume, confuse good with great, then I think uh, there are many reasons why we should challenge our perception of great as good. Great might not actually be good at all. Great might actually be something evil. What do I mean with this? Well, when we think of great people in the world today, people that have donated large amounts of money to charity, people that have, you know, done amazing acts uh, to promote peace or to protect the environment, people that have made insane compromises with their own needs and interests for the sake of human well-being and happiness. When we think of these people, we often build up false idealized images we create role models out of people that really might not be role models. These people might just be as complicated and as fragile as the rest of us. They might have big struggles and issues that they suffer from. This uh, desire to give and help the world might stem from a feeling of vanity, of wanting to appear like the perfect person to others, of struggling with your own self-image, of questioning your self-worth, and it might undermine your ability to have human relationships with others, to be a human person, to be healthy. It might interfere with your you know, body and your health and your physical well-being. It might really impact your ability to function and be a good person towards your friends and people around you. And this position might even shape your ego and make it hard for you to relate to and connect with other people. Great actions of kindness can be evil because they can be compensations for other problems. A lawyer who fights for human rights can be found to have uh, done a horrific act to their partner. And so, you know, besides of the good that they do, every single person is capable of doing bad things. The Good thing, the bad things they do don't override the fact that they do good things. And while they can be rightfully praised for the good that they do, we need to understand that they are humans just like the rest of us. They are human beings with human struggles and human frailties, just like all of us. There are no gods among men. There are no, uh, you know, Mother Teresa's. There are no uh, Mahatma Gandhi's, or rather, even if there are, they are humans just like the rest of us. And when we study them and look at their history, we find that yes, they did have problems. They did make mistakes. They did mess up. They did have their issues. And so we can't hold to this idea of toxic human beings and good human beings or great human beings. 
we should challenge the very idea of a great human being in the first place. And we should focus our attentions not on trying to emulate or be great like them, but rather we should try to think about what it could mean for us if we chose to be good. So what would it mean for you if you chose to be a good person in your own life, in your own work, in your own family, in your own relationships? What is the minimum amount of effort necessary for you to be a good person? And here it comes down to really the simplest things like what are some very simple small acts that you can do that t take very little time out of your day, very little resources that would make your partner happy or make your partner feel loved. Simple acts of expressions of love, simple acts of kindness, simple acts of uh, concerns for their health, physical touch. There are many things that you can do that add to and enrich other people's lives, not just your partner, but your friends and your co-workers. What are the simplest and nicest little acts that you can do at your workplace towards your co-workers, your manager, in order to just make them feel seen, heard, understood and respected? Often it's as easy as just telling them the truth, just being honest, just being a good example and just offering them simple words of encouragement. Being a good person is really not that hard and it doesn't take that much effort and people don't really expect as much from you as you think. People don't expect you to move the world for them. If a person becomes ill, they don't expect you to become a doctor and to heal them of their ailments. If a person loses their job, they don't expect you to pay their bills and to fix their issues and get them a job. People don't really expect as much from you as you think and don't really need as much from you as you think. All they need is your support, your listening ear or a phone call once in a while. And these kind of small acts really add to what can constitute a friendship. When we think about it, a friendship doesn't have to mean a lot and should not mean a lot. I like to offer the idea of a friendship as a mutually selfish arrangement. And what I mean is that you both benefit from each other's presence and existence. And it should be that you connect with each other because you have similar interests, similar hobbies, similar values, or similar goals. And because of this, you share a kinship with one another and it feels effortless to be friends with one another. It feels easy to be friends with one another. It doesn't require a lot for you to be friends with one another. All it takes is that you call each other once a month or that you meet up once in a while and spend a few hours just talking about life and doing something fun together. Friendships don't really require much of you and don't really demand much of you. And often the fundamental problem is really just questioning your tendency to make being good a difficult thing. You don't have to go vegan to show that you care for the environment, for animals or the environment. You don't have to, you know, end poverty or end world hunger to show that you care for people that are or have less than you. It just takes small acts of kindness and that's all there is. If we all engaged in these small acts of kindness, the world would be a lot better of a place. And there is something important to be said about this and that is that we should not aspire to put the world's collective sins on our shoulders. We should not, like Atlas, seek to make the problems of the world our problem, our individual problem. We should only make our own individual life our own problem. <laughs> we should make our own individual life, our own individual goals, our own in relationships, that should be our principal goals. That is what we should care about. That is what we should put our effort into. And if everyone did that, the world would be a lot better of a place. The environment would be in a better condition if everyone cared about their personal environment and the nature around them. The world would be a lot better of a place if everyone just helped the people that were closest to them. And you, by putting the world on your shoulders, by 
making the collective crimes of humanity your problem, your individual issue, you take away responsibility for people, for other people, from other people, and you need to let them have their own responsibility. Let other people have and worry about their own lives. Hold people only accountable to how other people live according to their own needs and ideals and dreams. Hold people only accountable to their own struggles in life, not to the problems of the people around them, not to the problems of the world. Nobody individually is to blame for the fact that the world is the way it is. There is no single individual we can point to for why the world is the way it is. We can only look at ourselves and what we are willing to do in our own life towards our own friends and our family. At least that's what I think and I'm just one person with one perspective and I have my own bias, my own skewed way of seeing things. I'm not a perfect person, I don't know everything, I don't have all the answers and neither do you. This kind of humility of realizing that you don't know everything, that you can't fix everyone, that you can't solve every problem, that you can't accomplish everything, that you can only accomplish what you can accomplish, what is right in front of you, what you have in your life. That humility, I think, could go a long way to saving humanity from itself.